Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Kucharine Nevishayi Shishunavani Kuscharine Om Namaste Vasute Vaya Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So yesterday we were introducing the topic of Dhruva Maharaj and how Dhruva Maharaj was inspired to go into the forest. However, on his journey to the forest, he met with Narada Muni, and Narada Muni was counseling him that this may not be the right thing to do. You can understand Dhruva Maharaj was really fortunate that he has someone who really cares about him who's coming there to guide him and to advise him. Just like we see Arjuna on the battlefield, Arjuna was also fortunate that he was blessed to have the association of Lord Krishna. So similarly, Dhruva Maharaj had the good fortune to meet Sri Narada Muni. And Narada Muni is discouraging him, just telling him that, well, you know, this may not be the right thing to do, someone at your age, you're young, you know, you're just a child, and you shouldn't take things so seriously, you know, we also can be affected like that. People sometimes say things to us, communication sometimes can be very harsh. We have to learn to tolerate. Those who are more advanced, they're more tolerant. But those of us who are more neophyte, then we can be disturbed, certainly. Our uh, enthusiasm or our, our appreciation for Krishna consciousness can really reduce if somebody is not very, very nice to us. <laughs> Harsh dealings. Srila Prabhupada gave the example, he said, just like in ISKCON, you know, Sunday feast program in a big center in ISKCON, they will cook a chutney. Those of you who are cooks, maybe you know how to make chutney. Chutney means like a jam, you know, maybe tomato chutney or apple chutney or find something like fruit chutney. So the chutney should be so hot, you can't stand it. But so sweet, you can't resist it. Right? That's a good chutney. It should be like that. It has to be, you know, you put quite a bit of chili and ginger in there. And of course, Tamil people, they like that, you know. They like the chili. And then you have to put quite a bit of sugar in there to make it really sweet, irresistible. So the example is given that association with devotees is a bit like that. So hot, you can't stand it. So sweet, you can't resist it. We hope. <laughs> we hope you can resist So. Dhruva Maharaj had uh, been affected by the harsh words of his stepmother, Suruchi, and because of the harsh words of his stepmother, he felt that he should go into the forest. Of course, his stepmother had also said that if you want to actually sit on your father's lap, if you want to be a king and have a throne, you have to take birth from my womb. And in order to do that, you should worship the Supreme Lord. And with the blessings of the Supreme Lord, then you may be able to take birth from my womb. 
then you might be able to sit on the throne and be the king. And so this greatly angered, had a very deep impression on the heart of Dhruva Maharaj. And after meeting with his mother, Suniti, she had confirmed to him that everything the stepmother had said was true. And she, des she described herself as being an unfortunate woman because Maharaj Uttanapada didn't really consider her to be his wife anymore. And he didn't even consider her to be a maidservant even, she said. So she was really in a, a difficult situation. And anyway, uh, she suggests to Dhruva Maharaj that, you know, you, you should try. You're also unfortunate because you're born from my womb. And she told Dhruva Maharaj that you're unfortunate and what you should do, you could go and try to find the Supreme Lord. You worship the Supreme Lord. He can fulfill your desire. And Dhruva Maharaj, in the Shatri mood, he had very ambitious desire. He wanted to have a kingdom greater than even Lord Brahma. And so his, his father was Maharaj Uttanapada, who was ruling the world. And Swayambhuvamanu was ruling, he had control over the universe. And Lord Brahma was the creator of the universe, and Dhruva Maharaj wants to have a position greater than all of them. That was his desire. He wants to have the ultimate position. Now it seems impossible. How could you ever get a position greater than Lord Brahma? But Impossible, Srila Prabhupada used to say, is a word in the fool's dictionary. Nothing is impossible for the devotee, for one who has taken shelter of the Lord. Right? So His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami, he would often recite, uh, Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangam Lam Gayate Girim Yakripata Maham Bandi Shri Gurum Dinatarinam, like that. By the mercy of the spiritual master, a lame man can cross mountains, a dumb man can recite poetry, a blind man can see the stars. It's all possible by the mercy of the spiritual master. And the spiritual master is the representative of the Supreme Lord, Shri Krishna. Now, we do see that Narada Muni in Srimad Bhagavatam, he is addressed as Bhagavan. So we may consider this Bhagavan, this is the name of the Supreme Lord Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, when Lord Krishna speaks, Srila Vyasadeva has put Sri Bhagavan Uvacha indicating that Lord Krishna is Bhagavan, that he is not the ordinary jiva. So similarly, Narada Muni is also not the ordinary jiva, but he is also a great soul. He is Shakta Vesha Avatar, and he is the representative of the Supreme Lord. So we may say that, no, Narada Muni is so great. Why didn't Narada Muni just simply give him the kingdom? You know, why does Dhruva Maharaj have to go to the forest at all? Why didn't he just give him the kingdom, give him the empire which he wants? Well, the, the, it's explained by Srila Prabhupada in his purports. He says, it's the duty of the spiritual master to engage the disciple in devotional service. It's not the business of the spiritual master to do everything for the disciple. Right? If, just like uh, in battle of Kurukshetra. Now Lord Krishna could have fought with them all. He could have fought the, with the whole Kurus and he could have killed everyone himself. But Lord Krishna wants to engage his devotees. He wants the, the credit to go to the devotees. And so similarly, 
Narada Muni is not going to do everything for Dhruva Maharaj. He wants Dhruva Maharaj to go off himself to the forest. He wants to see that practice of spiritual discipline. And then it, we, we, you will see how the Lord reciprocates with Dhruva Maharaj when, after seeing his determination. But that determination, that commitment to take up spiritual practice, that has to be there. The spiritual master wants to see that. So Srila Prabhupada used to always write to the devotees and encourage them and implore them to strictly follow, to do everything properly, that they are representing the the parampara, and he assured them that if they go on and do everything properly, in time, everything will come up nice. You'll get the results. The results will come. It just takes some time. In Dhruva Maharaj's case, it was to take six, six months, not a long time. We see uh, the gopis do Kajjaya Vrat. They did Kajjaya Vrat for one month. They got the result. They got Krishna as their mm -hmm. husband. And you see Sukadeva Goswami, he was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, rather Maharaj Parikshit was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from Sukadeva Goswami for seven days. He got the result. Maharaj Gadvanga had only a moment's time, but he got perfection in just a moment. So it's not the same for everyone. Bharat Maharaj had to take birth again. So we, we have to understand it's not the same for everyone. Some people may get the results very quickly. You may get the results you want. Some other people may take more time. But Krishna wants to see the devotee. He wants to see the devotee's steadfastness and determination in the practice of the principles of devotional service. So Narada Muni, after testing Dhruva Maharaj and, and discouraging him, if you like, discouraging him, telling him, you know, you better go back, you're too young. Uh, we see similar situation in Srimad Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, where Sukadeva Goswami is speaking to Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit wanted to know how to save people from going to hell. And Sukadeva Goswami began speaking about karmakanda activities that the process of atonement is to do karmakanda activities. But Maharaj Parikshit was alert. He was very attentive. He was very absorbed in hearing carefully. And when he heard this from Sukadeva Goswami, he replied that that's not a very good solution to do karmakanda activities. It won't take away the desire for sin one will go on sinning. And then Shukadeva Goswami suggested then Jnana Kanda. Instead of Karma Kanda, Jnana Kanda. Become fixed in speculative knowledge. But that was also rejected, to be rejected. Because with speculative knowledge, one will simply become impersonal. One would simply conclude that the Absolute is impersonal. So this was like a test from Sukadeva Goswami on Maharaj Pariksit. So Dhruva Maharaj was tested by Narada Muni and he, he impressed upon Narada Muni his determination to go forward. He said, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm that kind of person. He's a Kshatriya. 
and the, he had, although he was still a child, he had that Kshatriya mood. It was in his blood. And we often see this kind of thing, you know, children take on the qualities of the parents. Sometimes, you know, you will see in, for example, Loy Bazaar, you'll see they have shops and you'll see little children sit there in the counter, you know. They have the nature of their father, you know, to run the, run the shop and they can sit there happily because they're born in that kind of family. They're, they're shopkeepers and you could say Vaishya, like that. So the children have that mentality. In Braja, Nanda Maharaj, and Lord Krishna and Balaram were playing the part of cowherd boys. And there were so many other young cowherd boys who were taking the part of, they were growing up to be cowherd people. And so that mood is also there among the Kshatriyas. Those born in the, sh in the family of Kshatriyas, they have this special, this special characteristic of the Kshatriya caste. It described in, in the Krishna book how they needed to fight Jarasandha. There was a need for Maharaj Yudhisthira to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice. And in order to do that, they had to fight Jarasandha. And in this way, gain submission from all of the kings. And so it was, a great, it was arranged that Lord Krishna, along with Arjuna and Bhima, should all go to see Jarasandha. And Jarasandha, although he was a friend of Kamsa, his uh, daughters were all married to Kamsa. Uh, Jara Sanda was a demon, but he had the habit of giving charity to Brahmins. He was very fond of giving charity to the Brahmanas. He knew that by giving to the Brahmanas, he would benefit materially. He wasn't so much concerned about spiritual, but the, he knew material prosperity would come to him by giving charity to the brahmanas. So Lord Krishna along with Bhim and Arjun all went disguised as brahmanas and they went to beg charity from Jarasan. But Jarasan could understand when he saw them, he could understand, I don't think these people could be brahmanas. You know, that he saw especially Bhima and Arjuna you know, they're powerful, very strongly built. And they had even marks on their shoulder from carrying their weapons. Not only that, but their voices were like thunder. <laughs> One of the Kshatriyas, they have the quality of Ishwara Bhav. That quality to control others, you know. You know, sometimes you get people like that, you know, they're so authoritative that when they speak, you just, <gasps> you just freeze, you know. Some people are very powerful. They're, they're, they just by nature, they have that Ishwara Bhav, that quality to dictate and to organize and manage things and, and their voices are very powerful. So Dhruva, has this kind of nature from his childhood. He has, he has this mood that he cannot just simply take orders from others. The Kshatriya doesn't take orders, he gives orders. Just like there's a pastime that they wanted to collect some lotus flowers from some lake up in the Himalayas when the Pandavas were there in exile in the Himalayas. So Bhim went running to get the lotus flowers, but he was stopped by some Gandharvas. They told him, you can't go there. You have to get permission to take anything from there. But Bhima said, I'm a Kshatriya. I don't take permission from anyone. So that is the Kshatriya mood. The Kshatriya doesn't take orders. They give the orders. So similarly, Dhruva Maharaj, while only a child, 
he had this kind of nature, a little bit arrogant and not so submissive to hear Narada Muni. At the same time, he understands that Narada Muni could help him. He just felt that the instructions which Narada Muni was offering him at that particular time were not appropriate. That he was so much fixed on going to the forest and getting his revenge. He considered that if I go into the forest, I will, I will do something. I will find the if, if God is there, I will find him and I will get my desire fulfilled. So he had that kind of determination. And therefore, he, he told Narada Muni that I can't follow your advice. But, he said, I understand that you're a great soul and that you could help me, you could give me some advice of what I need to do in order to find the Supreme Lord. And then Narada Muni had compassion on him. He understood his genuine mood, that he really wants to go there. And so Narada Muni advised him that you should go to a holy place. The holy places are very important uh, for making spiritual advancement. It becomes very easy in the holy place. You go to a holy place like particularly for us Mayapur or Vrindavan, any of these kind of holy places we can go to and we become immediately absorbed in the spiritual atmosphere. The, there's a very special potency in the holy places. Of course, we say that, well, the Lord is everywhere. That's true, certainly. The Lord is everywhere. But you have to be advanced in order to feel the presence of the Lord everywhere. But when we go to the holy places, then it becomes easier to feel the presence of the Lord and to enter into the spiritual atmosphere there. It's much easier than in a, a living in a city. So Narada Muni's first advice is go to a holy place. And Narada Muni suggested to him, you go to Madhuvan. Madhuvan is one of the forests of Vrindavan. There are actually 12 forests in Vrindavan. Uh, on either situated around the Yamuna and Madhuvan is the place where Dhruva Maharaj was advised to go there. Go there and the Yamuna flows through the forest so Narada Muni advised Dhruva Maharaj that you should take up residence on the bank of the Yamuna and daily you have to bathe three times. And then he told Dhruva Maharaj that you should also worship the deity. You should have a form of the Lord to worship. That's also very important in our Krishna consciousness. We want to develop our consciousness of Krishna. We have to worship the Lord. It's not only just chanting his name, but also actually offering worship to the Lord. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu requested, sana, requested Haridas and uh, Lord Nityananda that they should go door to door and request everyone, read the books about Krishna, chant the name of Krishna and worship Krishna. Bolo Krishna, Bojo Krishna, Koro Krishna Shiksha. So the worship of the deity is also important for our spiritual development. And Srila Prabhupada was anxious in establishing centers that he also established deities in the center. We know in, in London, 
there's a, Prabhupada had sent the three householder couples to England to open the temple in London. And when they did get a place, then Prabhupada wanted that they should also put the deity. Although the devotees were very new and had no experience, but Prabhupada wanted to put the deities. Very important. People need to see the worship being performed. Not only do they need to see the worship being performed, the devotees need to perform the worship that it is very powerful for us. Rupa Goswami writes in the Nectar of Devotion that everyone from time to time should offer arti to the Lord. And you can see pictures of Srila Prabhupada offering arti to the deities, particularly at Vrindavan, Krishna Balaram Mandir, when they opened the temple, you can see Prabhupada offering the arti there. But Prabhupada didn't only offer the arti at the opening of the Krishna Balaram temple. There were other occasions also where Prabhupada would offer arti. And he certainly was anxious that devotees had to offer, to take part in the deity worship. Without the deity worship, then it's very difficult to keep up standards of punctuality and cleanliness. These two things are very important in Brahminical culture. There should be punctuality, the very regulated schedule of worship and offerings to the deity. And cleanliness also is very important. And that is why you could say Dhruva Maharaj was told to bathe three times a day in the Yamuna. If you take bath three times a day, that's a, you're going to be pretty clean, right? You, you're pretty pure. It's nice. And so cleanliness and punctuality important in Brahminical culture. So Dhruva Maharaj had to go to Madhuvan, take bath three times a day, have a deity, worship the deity. And Narada Muni talks about what he can offer to the deity. He said, he said, you offer what is available there in the forest. And Srila Prabhupada comments on how he was criticized by people. Some people would criticize Srila Prabhupada that he had installed the deities but he hadn't got all the proper paraphernalia. For example, some people say you should worship the deity with Ganga Jal. You must have Ganga Jal or Yamuna, water from the Yamuna. And if you don't worship the deity with these waters, then it's not proper. But Prabhupada says, well, how to get Ganga or Yamuna water when you're so far away the other side of the world? You have to consider everything in terms of the time and the place and the circumstances. But Prabhupada said, the water should be clean and pure. It should be, you know, sanctified water, not just any dirty water. It must be, you know, nice, clean, fresh water. And that can be used for the worship of the deity. And those people who are doing puja for the deities, generally, we will call the holy rivers into the water by mantra. Hmm? You can chant a mantra and inv invoke the presence of the holy rivers into the water. Of course, nowadays you can also get bottles of Ganga Jal from India, from Mahapur, and you put a little drop of Ganga Jal in every day, and in this way, the whole water can become Ganga Chal. So that was one criticism which people made about Prabhupada's deity worship. But Prabhupada said, they don't understand the necessity to introduce the deity worship. That you cannot, you cannot uh, come to all of these standards. You cannot wait for all of these standards to fall in place before you can introduce deity worship. You have to make a start somewhere. 
get, get the devotees to do the deity worship, and then gradually bring up the standards. So like that, the, the devotees in the beginning, of course, second initiation, brahminical qualities and so on, that it wasn't so much there. And Srila Prabhupada brought deities to Australia. He brought the deities in an airplane. They traveled in transit through Malaysia, went on to Australia. They brought the deities there to Australia. Prabhupada then said to the deities, I'm leaving you in the hand of these malachas. <laughs> Prabhupada said like that to the deities. He said, but he said, in the future we will improve. He said, please tolerate for now. So like this, Srila Prabhupada introduced the deity worship. And then of course Tosi was another thing. And Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport in this section with Dhruva Maharaj. He said, we were very sad when we went to the Western countries and we couldn't find any Tosi. There was no Tosi there in the West when Prabhupada went. But then Prabhupada acknowledges how his disciple Govinda Devi Dasi, an American woman, she had learned to grow Tosi from seeds. She she'd, somehow she got some seeds of Tosi. I'm not sure how she got the seeds, whether Prabhupada gave them or what. But anyway, she got the seeds and she was able to grow Tosi. And Prabhupada said, now we have Tosi growing in all of our centers. And you can go to places like Canada, where it's bitterly cold for six months or more in the year, or Russia and China and so on, and you'll find Tosi plants are there. Tosi is growing. In the UK also, no sunshine. Tosi, how can she live without sunshine? But the devotees have a sun lamp. They put some electrical lighting system and in this way they're able to cultivate the Tosi. Because the worship of Tosi is so much important in the worship of Krishna. It goes along with the worship of Krishna. Wherever there's the worship of Lord Krishna or Lord Vishnu, there will also be a Tosi plant. You'll see Tosi there. And so it's a very important part in the deity worship. I don't know, in Vrindavan, probably Tosi was already there. It's mentioned there that Dhruva Maharaj could get Tosi. Because Vrindavan is land of Tosi. Tosi grows there. And so certainly Tosi was there. And Dhruva Maharaj utilized the Tosi for his worship. And then Prabhupada then speaks about mantra, giving the mantra for the worship. Along with deity worship, there will also be the mantra. A mantra to, mantras are given from the spiritual teacher. So Narada Muni instructed Dhruva Maharaj in the uh, twelve syllable mantra Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya twelve syllables so that mantra Prabhupada explains begins with the pranav Om Om it begins with Om and the caste Brahmins the smarter Brahmins they claim that only caste Brahmins only those people born in Brahmana families should recite the pranav mantra. They object to this. But Srila Prabhupada quotes that Narada Muni gave this mantra to Dhruva Maharaj. Now Dhruva Maharaj is not a Brahmin. He's a Kshatriya. But, Dhruva, but Narada Muni gave him the pranav mantra to chant. And so Srila Prabhupada said, there's no restriction on who should chant this pranav mantra, provided they are genuine in their application of devotional service. Of course, to perform devotional service was the very first instruction which Narada Muni gave to Dhruva Maharaj. 
and he told Dhruva Maharaj, he said, your mother was right that Suniti told you to take shelter of the Personality of Godhead. So this is what you should do. And he, then he's telling Dhruva Maharaj how he can take shelter of the Personality of Godhead. He's explaining to him the process by which he can approach the Lord. Dhruva Maharaj, of course, as we said yesterday, he has material desires. And we should understand that even though we have material desires, we're not barred from the practice of devotional service. But by executing devotional service, we will become purified of our material desires. Of, if your material desires are less, then that's good. The, your devotional service will be even better. But even if you have material desires, you should want to do more devotional service. Because the more you engage in devotional service, the more you can relieve yourself from the material desires. So we have the example of Dhruva Maharaj. Of course, he is going to become purified by his practice of devotion. And you have also Srimad Bhagavatam describes about Gajendra, the elephant, how he also had material desire. He wanted to be saved from the crocodile which was, in tank, which was attacking him and holding his leg. Dhruva, and Gajendra also became purified by devotional service. So devotional service is not restricted to just simply brahmanas by caste, but it's for everyone. And even people who, have, who are born outside the Vedic culture, but who practice the principles of devotional service, they can all be engaged in the devotional activities and they can chant the pranav mantra. So, Dhruva Maharaj was told to chant this mantra. It's mentioned that he was supposed to chant the mantra three times a day. Just as he was taking bath three times a day, he was chanting the mantra three times a day. He was also engaging, it's mentioned, he was doing astanga yoga to fix the mind on the form of the Lord. To fix the mind on the form of the Lord and chanting the mantra is also not different from the Lord. Srila Prabhupada, one time he had one of his disciples, it was a sannyasi at the time, uh, it was a Chutananda Swami, and he, Prabhupada asked him to give a lecture on the Ten Offenses. Srila Prabhupada was going to give initiation. So a Chutananda Swami said, at, at one point in the course of his lecture, he said, Krishna is in his name. And Prabhupada immediately, he'd been sitting there listening to the lecture, and he enjoyed the lecture very much. But when Achyutananda said this, that Krishna is in his name, Prabhupada adjusted it. He said, Krishna is his name. They're one and not different. The name of Krishna is not different from Krishna himself. And similarly, the chanting of this mantra, Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya, this is non-different from the Lord himself. So when we chant the holy name, we should understand the Lord is there in the holy name. Of course, that is bhava. That is the level of bhava, offenseless chanting. We have to come to the offenseless level in order to realize that. But that is required in our chanting. We do want to avoid offenses. And we want to chant the name with great attention and care, understanding the Lord is in his the Lord is his name, and they're not different. 
Chaitanya Charitamrita says, Nam Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purna Shuddha Nityamukto Binat Nam Nama Namino. Right? The holy name is Chintamani. It is a wish fulfilling touchstone. Fulfills all of our desires, both materially and spiritually. It is Purna Shudo, it is completely pure. Nitya Mukto, eternally liberated. Binat Nam Nam Nam. It's not different from the Lord Himself. And we say, Kali Kali Nama Rupe, Krishna Avatar. The Lord comes in the form of His holy name in the Kali Yuga. So, Dhruva Maharaj was advised like this, you have to worship according to the means. And living in the forest, as Dhruva Maharaj is doing, he has to take advantage of whatever is there. It's mentioned how when Dhruva Maharaj began to do his austerities, during the first month, he was simply eating a, a kind of fruit which grows there which is never eaten by human beings. And some fruit which grows there in the forests of Vrindavan, some tree there. And Prabhupada said, this fruit is never usually eaten by human beings. He said, sometimes the monkeys may eat it, or the birds, but usually humans will never eat it. But this is what Dhruva Maharaj was eating during the first month of his austerity. And that was only once every three days. He was simply eating to keep body and soul together. So Srila Prabhupada discusses in the purport in relation to this text about how dedicated we have to be in the practice of Krishna consciousness. That if we want to become Krishna conscious, we have to seriously apply ourselves to the principles of Krishna consciousness. Just as Dhruva Maharaj took the instructions of Narada Muni very seriously, Prabhupada said, we shouldn't expect that we can imitate Dhruva Maharaj. He said, that is not possible. But he said, the mood that are the the, that attitude which is there in the application, in the spiritual practice, that is required and that should be intense. We should really intensely devote ourselves to following out the orders of the spiritual master. And not just only the main orders, but all of the instructions of the spiritual master. And Srila Prabhupada comments about uh, offering things to the deities. And he says, of course, he said, for the deities, we want to offer the best. I had, I remember one pastime, you know, people always ask me, tell me some pastimes about Srila Prabhupada. So I'll tell you one just now. It happened in Calcutta Temple, and it must have been 1976. So we have the fruit offering every afternoon in Temple, and Prabhupada was very, always very concerned about the offerings. What is the standard of the offerings? He wanted to see what was being offered to the deities, and so Prabhupada that afternoon. He said, bring me the maha, let me have some maha, maha fruit. So they brought the fruit to Prabhupada. And when Prabhupada tasted the fruit, and he said, who bought this fruit? And so they mentioned that there was this one devotee, he was, he was, he was not initiated, but he was, uh, he was like about 30 years old, and he was a congregation member, he was coming to the temple very regularly. And he was helping a lot because we were, you know, in those days, our Indian temples, we were mo mostly foreigners. 
There were very few Indian devotees. So it was very useful to have him around because he could speak Bengali and none of us were very good in Bengali. So this, this man Debu, he was coming and he had been the one to purchase the fruit. You know, going to market is also it's better if you can speak the language and if you're a local person, you'll think you'll get a better price, you know. Because Prabhupada said, my disciples there, he would call us dam cheap baba, you know. Because he, we would say, oh, very cheap Prabhupada, I bought it very cheap. And Prabhupada would say, how much you paid? And when we told Prabhupada the price, he said, you paid twice the price. He said, <laughs> he said it should have been half that what you paid. You got cheated. But we were thinking, I did very good. So Prabhupada called Dam Cheat Baba. <laughs> so anyway, Prabhupada tasted the fruit that afternoon and he asked who purchased it. And then he said, okay, tell Debu to come and see me. So Debu went there and Prabhupada told him, he said, you are Bengali and you buy fruit like this for the deities? He said, this is not good. He said, you're a Bengali boy, you should know what is good fruit, how you could buy this for the deities. So Prabhupada was teaching us that, you know, in the worship of the deities, you have to be very conscious, very careful. You know, they, we don't just offer any old garbage to the deities, we offer the best things. But for ourselves, we're not so worried, you know, we can take anything. But for Krishna, we want to give the best. Um, Prabhupada said, devotees shouldn't be too uh, particular about eating prasadam. They shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be gourmets, right? You know what a gourmet is, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tamal Krishna Maharaj used to say, he said, some people call me a gourmet sannyasi. <laughs> because he was, he was very particular also about what people cook for them. And he would say to me, he said, I know they can do better. <laughs> so, you know, if, if they didn't cook very good, he'd chastise them and say, you know, this is terrible, why are you... <laughs> he said, I know they can do better. He said, that's why I'm telling. So similarly, Prabhupada was also stressing to us the importance in the standards, in how we worship the deities, that we must worship the deities nicely and we don't offer just any old thing to the deities. You want to try to give the best to Krishna. But at the same time for ourselves, well, you can read the Nectar of Instruction. Prabhupada quotes Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Raghunath Das Goswami. Now, Raghunath Das Goswami, of course, was a renun renunciate, you know, total vairagi. But Lord Chaitanya told him, do not dress opulently and do not eat opulent foodstuffs. And of course, so Raghunath was very, very renounced. He was very extreme in that regard. And Jagannath Puri, he'd get the rice from the drain and wash it and then dry it and then eat it. And Lord Chaitanya praised him. He said, oh, this is nectar. Just give me some. Anyway, uh, that's Raghunath Das Goswami, very special personality. But Prabhupada quotes Lord Chaitanya's instruction to him that do not eat opulent, do not talk like the common people and do not hear what they say also. And do not eat opulently, do not dress extravagantly. But always keep your mind always on remembering the divine couple, Radha and Krishna. Raghunath Das had asked through Swarup Damodar, Swarup Damodar was his mentor, and Raghunath asked, please ask Lord Chaitanya to give me some instruction. So Swarup Damodar asked Lord Chaitanya, and this is what Lord Chaitanya told to Swarup Damodar to tell Raghunath Das. And Prabhupada quotes in the Nectar of Instruction. And then again in relation to Dhruva Maharaj, Prabhupada again talks that as devotees, he said, 
we should be frugal. Don't eat opulent, don't be demanding opulent foodstuffs. Don't try to eat opulent foodstuffs, but keep, listen, keep yourself simple and uh, basic. You know, don't say, oh, kitchery again. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. Prabhupada called kitchery the poor man's feast. And we're all poor. Right? We're all poor people. So every day if you have kitchari, it's a feast. So in this way, Dhruva Maharaj was, he got the instructions from Narada Muni, and he went into the forest. And then, the first month, he just ate once every three days. And then the second month, then he stopped, oh, he was eating grass and dry leaves the second month, every six days. And then the third month, it was water, every nine days. And then the fourth month, because he was doing also some astanga yoga, he knew pranayama, so he was controlling his breath also. And so he regulated his breathing, that he he was breathing, I don't, how many days was it? I don't remember. Anyway, but he, he very much drastically reduced his breathing. And so it came to the point that after five months, the whole universe was suffocating because Dhruva Maharaj was controlling his breathing to such an extent, not only was he controlling his breathing, but he was fully absorbed in the, the Supreme Lord, and the Supreme Lord was residing in his heart. So Dhruva Maharaj, because of his meditation on the Supreme Lord, and by his restricting his own breathing, all the living entities in the universe, including the demigods, they were all suffocating. And it's said that the, the whole earth was pushed down just by the toe of Dhruva Maharaj. Oh, Dhruva Maharaj, in addition to all of the things he was doing, he was standing on one leg <laughs> as well. Standing on one leg and his big toe, after five months, by dint of his powerful meditation and his absorption in the Supreme Lord and his re re restraint in breathing, the, the whole universe, or at least the earth, was pushed down by his big toe. And in this way, the demigods were all worried. They thought, wow, we're all going to die. We're all suffocating. We can't breathe. We never experienced anything like this before. And they went to the Supreme Lord, to the Personality of Godhead, and they requested him, what is wrong? Please save us. And the Lord told them that this is simply the result of Dhruva Maharaj's austerities. Don't worry, Dhruva Maharaj is not going to kill you. He's a Vaishnava and he's compassionate on all living entities. He's a devotee and I will go and see him and adjust the situation. And so in this way, the Lord is going to appear before Dhruva Maharaj and explain to Dhruva Maharaj that he is going to give him the fulfillment of his desires. He is going to give him a kingdom even greater than Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma resides on Satya Loka. You know, above Swarga Loka, you have four planets. There's Janaloka, Mahaloka, Tapaloka, and then Satyaloka. There at the top, Satyaloka is way at the top of the universe where Lord Brahma resides. So, Dhruva Maharaj was given, he's told he's going to get residence on the pole star. We, some, we often call it Dhruva Loka. It's a planet where Dhruva Maharaj resides. And on that planet, the pole star, 
that is where Sweta Dweep is. And on Sweta Dweep, there's the island where Shirodakashai Vishnu resides. And so that place, the pole star, even the demigods cannot go there. They have to meditate. Even Lord Brahma cannot go there. They have to just meditate to Shirodakashai Vishnu from the shore of the milk ocean. But they cannot directly go there. But Dhruva Maharaj, he is given, he was told, you're going to reside there. And that Dhruva Loka, that pole star, that is a spiritual planet. Although it's within the universe, it's never annihilated at the time of annihilation. So it's a very special planet. And it said all the planets in the universe, they all rotate around the pole star. The pole star is at the center, and all the planets in the universe, they're all rotating around the pole star, offering their obeisances to Shirodakashai Vishnu and Dhruva Maharaj. So, before Dhruva Maharaj was able to go there, however, he had to become the king, because that was his desire also. So, the Lord tells him that you're going to become the king, you will rule the world for 35,000 years. And then, Later, late, then you will go to Shirodak, then you'll go to the pole star. So that comes later on in the pastime of Dhruva Maharaj, how he goes back to Godhead. So Dhruva Maharaj is the hero for all the living entities on this planet, that we are all coming in the line of Swayambhuvamanu. Swayambhuvamanu is our great ancestor, and Dhruva Maharaj is the grandson of Swayambhuva Manu. So Dhruva Maharaj's austerities and performance of tapasya is a great, great, uh, it, it, it's a great uh, credit to him that he could do such wonderful things as a young child at the age of five that he could perform so much austerity in tapasya that within six months the Lord would appear before him and fulfill his desires. So Dhruva Maharaj is such a, a famous king. He went on to rule the world for 35,000 years as a great king. And then he retired and went to Badarik Ashram where he resided there in Badarik Ashram doing tapasya, and he was very, very strict sadhaka. When he was a young boy, he was a very strict sadhaka, and even in his old age, he is there in Badarik Ashram, he was doing very strict sadhana. And the Vaikuntha aeroplane came with the two men from Vaikuntha to take him to Vaikuntha, and when they told him that, then first of all, he went and performed so many different duties. He went to other saintly persons and offered his obeisances to them and took their blessings. And he, he, he performed many different uh, preliminary activities before he got into the airplane. As he got into the airplane, then death personified appeared before him and Dhruva Maharaj simply stepped on the head of death personified and got into the aeroplane, indicating that Dhruva Maharaj had no fear of death. Death appeared before him, but he was not afraid. He had already realized his spiritual identity, and he was simply waiting to transfer himself to the spiritual world. He's already sure of his destiny, the Lord has already told him that he's going to go to the pole star and he will reside there. But as he got in the airplane, he remembered his mother, of course. And he said, what about my mother? I can't go without my mother. And it said his mother was like his shiksha guru. 
And they said, don't worry, your mother is also going. There was another airplane and his mother was getting in that airplane. She was also going back to Godhead. And so in this way, his mother also went to Dhruvaloka to be there. I guess she went to Dhruvaloka. Anyway, she went to the spiritual world. And so this is a brief summary of the pastimes of Dhruva Maharaj. Are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Well, meek and humble is the quality of the Brahman. It's not the quality of uh, a Kshatriya <laughs> or a Vaishya, really. But this is a, a Brahminical quality. This is one of the reasons why Dhruva Maharaj couldn't take the advice of Narada Muni. He didn't have that renunciation and that humility which are really the hallmarks of a Brahmin. In the Brahminical culture, one should be like that, meek and humble. Bhagavad Gita says, Vidya Vinaya Sampani, learned and gentle Brahmana. So Brahmanas are expected to be like something like that. But uh, you're working in the corporate world, that's not Brahman. That's not for the Brahmins, you know. You, you lose your Brahminical culture there. <laughs> but still, as a devotee, as a devotee, uh, the, the, it, uh, I remember there was this one, there's this one man, this very wealthy man from Bombay. I think it's Mr. Chandrai or something like that. Just Lok Hospital, yeah, you know. Anyway, a very, very big man in Bombay. And uh, they said, he's, he's like a lamb in the, feet, in the temple, and when he go goes to the office, he's like a lion. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to have that kind of dual personality, you know. You're going to be in the corporate world. You have to, you have to, Sometimes you have to do things which you may feel is not very appropriate as a devotee. Just like Narada Muni is told that Narada Muni had initiated one snake and told the snake that now you're initiated, you cannot bite anyone. But when the, the snake didn't bite anyone, then the children were taking advantage of the snake and they were throwing stones at it and they were teasing it. And, you know, they weren't afraid of it anymore. And they gave the snake a very difficult time. So the snake came to Narada Muni and complained, you know, you said I can't bite anyone anymore. But these children are making my life so miserable. What am I supposed to do? So Narada Muni said to the snake, I said you shouldn't bite, but you can show your teeth to them. <laughs> and you can raise your hoods before them. And in that way, they'll be afraid when they so the snake did that, and when the children came, then the snake rose up as if he's going to bite them. Then the children all ran away. So, like that, sometimes you have to, uh, you know, take on a, a particular mood. Time, place, and circumstances. You know, you're in the corporate world. You're not on the altar. So it's a little different, quite different. So, yes, meek and gentle. What does it mean, meek or meek and humble? Meek and humble means 
Amanina manadena, right? Offer all respects to others and not anxious to be respected yourself. That is the meaning of meek and humble. Tolerant like the tree, devoid of false ego. Our ego should be in proportion to our spiritual dimension. Our spiritual dimension, one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. So the ego, our ego should be in proportion to that, not in proportion to our six, six feet, uh, 500, uh, 100 kg or whatever, you know. You know, you, you, have to, you have to come out of the bodily concept for spiritual consciousness. So chanting the holy name, Kirtani Yasadahari, that will help us to get out of that bodily conception of life. Chanting the holy name helps us to become meek and humble. Constant chanting of the holy name will help us to develop that meekness and humility. Yes, any other question? Yes, Maharaji? Why didn't you go to Golok Dam? Or, well, Golok Dam is for people in the mood of Vrindavan. Dhruva Maharaj wasn't in the mood of Vrindavan. The bridge, you know, you have to be in that Brajbasi mood to get into Golok. You have to go and live in Braja. You have to become a cowherd boy and you have, or a gopi or something. You want to go to Golok? You have to cultivate the mood of the Brajbasis. Otherwise, you'll never make it. So Dhruva Maharaj was not in that braja mood. Dhruva Maharaj was a kshatriya and he was in the royal family. He had this, you know, very different kind of nature from Brijbasi people. Hmm? But he had that desire, he wanted the kingdom. And so they gave it to him, a kingdom greater than Brahma. So there, you go to the pole star. Nobody else had been there before. They sent him to, to there. So he got, it was his desire. You get what you want. You know, you worship the, he worshipped the Lord. He had that desire. Oh, later on, if I do more classes on Dhruva Maharaj, then we can explain how after the Lord appears to Dhruva Maharaj and tells him what's going to happen to him, Dhruva Maharaj is not very happy. He feels sorry that he's, you know, that he approached the Lord with such a material desire. So this was the problem. Although we said you can worship the Lord with material desires, but you'll get your material desires. You get what you approach. So Dhruva Maharaj was coming to him to get this kingdom. He got it. And you can say, oh no, I don't want it now. <laughs> oh, too bad, Baba. <laughs> you ask for it, you're going to take it, you know. And so, anyway, um, it's a, there's an interesting purport there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada writes four pages with comments by the different acharyas. You can read it for yourself. But why Dhruva Maharaj was unhappy after the Lord had come and appeared to him and told him everything that you're going to get the kingdom, you're going to do this, you're going, you're going to go there. And so Dhruva Maharaj didn't feel very satisfied with himself. So it's like a warning to all of us. You get the resultant of your desires. You know, what we desire, what do we cultivate, what kind of desires we are having. We have to be very conscious and careful. Okay, Hare Krishna.
Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada. So Hare Krishna to all devotees, thank you very much for joining us today and yesterday. It's so encouraging to see so many devotees coming. The good news is, if all goes well, we pray Maharaj will be with us for the next few days and even next week. And we are inviting devotees to have a combination of programs where we, we would like to ask congregations, you know, where you're active, to invite Maharaj so that you meet devotees and new persons who may not always come, come during the the programs, but they are being cultivated nicely in your congregations. So please, if you can work that out, please arrange with Padmanochan Prabhu, who is organizing the schedules. At the same time, there will also be programs in Goranga Center, so that the devotees who are regularly coming here can also have the opportunity to hear from Maharaj. If there are devotees here who uh, would want to spend some time or would like to meet Maharaj, again, please check with Padmanochan Prabhu, he can liaise with Maharaj. We are very fortunate to have Maharaj in Singapore after so many years. And now we should not we, we, we should not lose this opportunity. And when, when Sadhu comes, we should actually drop everything just to be able to serve him. And that 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 goes for all of us. So thank you, Maharaj, for being here. And yes, we do want to hear more of Guru Maharaj's pastime, so we hope to plan that. Tomorrow in the evening, Maharaj will be meeting the Arsa Kesri Temple Congregation. That will be in the evening. On Sunday, Maharaj will take the uh, Bhagavatam class in Goranga Center from 7.30 to 8.30. And then Maharaj will also be back in the Goranga Center in the evening to also meet the Bengali devotees for a program. But all are welcome for that program too. Uh, and if you want to come for that program, my suggestion is come a bit earlier because it will fill up very fast. So we have, we have at least for the next two days, we have confirmed We'll work with Maharaj and Padmanocham Prabhu and keep all of you informed on the other days as we move forward. Thank you very much. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Nasinga Maharaj Ki Srila Prabhupada Ki And we'd like to invite devotees for prasadam. So please come and have your prasadam. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, very happy to see you. Hare Krishna. Oh, are you Maharaj? Yeah.